So if anybody has other questions, the uh, floor is open. Let me just actually say something to follow up what you said. Um, one of the things that uh, I think has been shown by research is when we're looking at uh, testing, you've got uh, students who are learning uh, English, they're learning content through English, so they've got some of that vocabulary down in, in English. But their first language is also there, but typically as, as English goes up, often the first language is going down. And so what works best, rather than a separate test in, say, Spanish or whatever the language is, is if the student has both languages there. And so, and, and math problems uh, are really tough because it's a whole new language. And, but, and so they'll go back and forth, they'll kind of reprocess in one language what they're not getting in the other. So that's better than having the two languages separate. Yeah, just letting you know that th that is a longer video that's 12 minutes, and that's what the teacher does. She goes down and she gets the tests in Spanish for him, and that's what they do. So, yeah. yeah. There's a longer version of that. Great. Okay, a anything that anybody else wants to bring up? Not just to me, but to anybody, uh, like, just open it up for discussion. Yeah, Tina. So we had our list of seven strategies. What's missing? Like that's uh, so we got a lot from your presentation this morning. So we're new coaches in this job, EAL coaches. So we're really happy for everything you shared today. And now we're gonna go take it home and process it and things. Well, obviously, you know, when Suzanne was talking uh, with her ten things to to do or think about doing, you know, I think one thing you could do is take a look at the seven strategies that you came up with. Uh, the um, uh, 10 that uh, Suzanne came up with. And then I had sort of six kind of major uh, yeah. things that we keep in mind. And there's obviously a lot of overlap in yeah. there, like comprehensive input is the same as, as scaffolding uh, instruction. But I think and a lot of the issues that Suzanne talked about and you talked about in terms of making students feel welcome is an issue of identity. Um, and if you go back to what Tomer, the boy who's uh, from Israel, who um, uh, wrote the dual language book, and, and there's lots of, of examples of that. One of the things he says is when you don't know the language, you feel like a, a baby, it makes you feel like a baby. Not too many 11-year-old boys or girls feel like that. That's an identity statement. Um, one thing I wanted to do in my presentation, and, and some a teacher here at Ling vetoed it, and it's not, he's not here today. But, <laughs> but I was thinking, I wanted to say, try to introduce yourself, but don't use the letters N and T. Right? And just think about that. Like, I am a, no, I'm a, I'm a well, girl, you know, <laughs> and how hard that is. Um, but the reason I mentioned that is there's lots of good ideas about second language um, helping students. For example, one teacher I had, she contacted this Ukrainian mom and she said, your son was talking about how he swims. Can you send me some pictures that you have on your phone of the Ukraine? And this teacher downloaded these pictures and then he started labeling them and then writing stories about himself and sharing it with his class. Like, you can start small. It doesn't have to be a whole book. Yeah, and, and again, you mentioned technology and uh, uh, we can use that uh, as a way of kind of working with students to bring some of their cultural uh, values and, and experiences into the classroom. I'm sure if, if one were to go to YouTube, uh, you find all kinds of videos with Ukrainian dancing in there, the costumes that are there, and then you know potentially have the students from Ukraine who are in the class explain if they've had those kinds of experiences or what those costumes mean or where they come from, and then other students can do the, the same, same kind of thing. It's, um, and again, we can do all kinds of um, kind of cross-curricular uh, reinforcement here. If you're talking about, say, a student who, from Ukraine showing a YouTube video that uh, expresses aspects of his or her culture that's relevant, you could have the student from Afghanistan or Japan or, or Spain or wherever uh, do the same thing and have maybe two or three students uh, a week uh, do that. And, uh, then you've got that, the map of the, the world or the globe up there. We point out where these countries are. And so world geography may not, may not be something that we do at grade six or grade seven or grade eight, but grade one students will know exactly where Bangladesh is or Sri Lanka is because one of the friends that they play soccer with after school comes from there. So if we personalize uh, the experiences and bring, not, it's not up to us to bring kids' experiences into class, but to open the door so that they can bring their experiences in. We can do a lot more, uh, and that can also involve parents who uh, can come in and demonstrate 
costumes that they might uh, wear or all kinds of stuff. So, you know, there's a lot that you, we, we tend to focus on the challenges, uh, but there's a lot of opportunities there too. And I think that ties in really closely to my, our, my student population. I work with students with significant educational gaps, like Suzanne. Yeah. And so it's sometimes really challenging for the teachers that are working with these kids to understand they can't read in Arabic or in Sikura or so they don't have that first language literacy, but they still have a lot that they can do in the classroom. So teachers are saying, well, I'll just translate it into Arabic. They can't read Arabic. So that, that bridge is really challenging to give them a place where they cannot feel like babies yeah. and find literature that they can read that's not ch with little kids with pigtails yeah. and, um, and to be able to really show all the they have huge skill set. Like they're intelligent and they've got knowledge of the world. And but finding a place within that whole school where they can profile that is sometimes really challenging for a, like that whole school approach. And then you're you get we we were doing a good job, and then you, all your staff changes. <laughs> yeah. So then you kind of get to start over because you yeah it's it's a it's a challenge for sure. And, and you know if we do a little bit of uh, research, um, and I think Suzanne emphasized this uh, also in terms of. Uh, using the CIA as a, as a friend, uh, but um, but you know if you look at if, if we familiarize yourself a little bit with the the history of some of the newcomer cultures that are coming in, and w w share with students and their parents because they may not know this that know this that the Arabic speaking cultures uh, in the Middle Ages uh, were way in advance in terms of, of cultural knowledge uh, compared to um, uh, many other cultures around the world. And there's a, there's a book written uh, about how you know, um, European culture uh, was basically preserved uh, uh, through the so-called Dark Ages by Arabic scholars. Um, you know, it's one of those books, I think there were several of them, you know, uh, the one that I'm most familiar with, obviously, is how the Irish saved civilization. <laughs> but, but there's other, you know, this, the same kind of one is written. <laughs> but, but there's, you know, th those, you know, sharing that with, um, uh, with students, you know, doing a little bit, bit of digging and we'll find uh, YouTube resources for that. Uh, having students maybe watch it at home and then do a little bit of research themselves and then they come in maybe with their parents or a group of them do research and they make a presentation to the class. It's, um, you know, it's, it's not that difficult with the technology that we've got right now to find all kinds of resources that can affirm students' cultures, identities, etc. I've been cut off, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so I became a teacher many years ago because of an encounter with uh, an amazing educator and writer from New Zealand named Sylvia Ashton Warner. And her very first book, Teacher, which is printed many years ago, tells the story of how she taught Maori children to read in her native New Zealand by asking them a series of simple questions. She called it key vocabulary. And the questions were, who do you love? What are you afraid of? What's your name? What's your real name? Etc. And she would take their answers and print them out on cards. And she said she could take a handful of these cards with 20 students, throw them on the floor and say, find your words. And they would find those words because they had such emotional relevance to them as individuals. So the lesson that I take from that is that we should not be afraid to bring emotion and emotional values into the classroom. And I'll share one little story. I was teaching in the Gulf Islands of BC. I had 12 kids in the school, in a school that was about to be renovated, crammed into the principal's daughter's what had been a bedroom. And I had this one very bright young girl who was a real troublemaker. She was entirely too smart. She would talk when she wasn't supposed to talk. It finally got to be too much. And the day that she brought me back her spelling work and said, I don't want to do this anymore. I said, Autumn, it's your work. You have to do it. And she said, fine. And she stormed out and almost went off the school grounds. The kids came back to me. It was uh, lunchtime. They said, Autumn's outside the school. I said, well, tell her she has to either go home or come here. And if she goes home, she's going to have to come back with her parents. So she slunk back in, and the, the day was over. They were all hanging around the door to see what kind of trouble she'd get into. And I said, come on in, Autumn. And she came in, and she moved the chair into the very corner of the classroom and sat facing the corner. So I got a chair, and I sat down beside her, and I thought about it. And finally, I said to her, 
because I knew her parents. I said, it's, it's really hard when your parents are breaking up, isn't it? And she started to cry, and I started to cry. And I said to her, Autumn, listen, here's the thing. This year, you're so smart, I will not give you lower than a B in anything. And uh, if you want to do the work, you do the work. If you don't, you don't. If you need to go outside and the playground or go home, you just tell me. As long as I know where you are, that's it. She said, really? I said, yeah. Can I go now, she said. I said, yeah. And then immediately I was berating myself. <laughs> oh, but, and I, no, I just gave her some slack in the middle of a really tough year. She came in the next day with a big smile on her face. She sailed through it. She did all her work. She handed over the main part in the play that had been written to her to her best friend. It was like an amazing year for her. Um, so that's, the, that's my touchstone for pay attention to emotion. Say yes to emotion in the classroom because it's something we all share, right? It's a place you can connect, regardless of what culture you come from. That's all. I, I think you know, that illustrates something that I think was implicit in, in everything that Suzanne and Tina were saying, mm -hmm. and that's the fact that teachers have got to see themselves as learners. Because mm -hmm. uh, if, uh, if teachers are not learning a lot from their students, it's probable that, te that their students are not learning a lot from them. And, oh, I've done uh, so many stupid, thoughtless things over the years. I could like go on the browser and just that one time. You did right. Right thing. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. It, the district, the English district, has adopted the deep learning model and invested quite a bit into it. Um, and I'm, I'm always, um, I guess, curious, or I'd like to hear your thoughts on the intersection between the education of English language learning, especially any with the access in first language literacy and the deep learning model. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm not uh, familiar okay. with the deep learning model. I assume it's sort of an inquiry based uh, yes, model. Yes, it's yeah. very much project based, yeah. sort of higher order, yeah. and um, yeah, it's a Michael Fullan. Michael Fullan. Yeah. yeah. No, it's like basically uh, that kind of uh, orientation where students are generating knowledge rather than just being passively receiving knowledge, that makes a huge amount of sense uh, because all the information is out there. You know, uh, what we need to do is get deeper into that information so we understand it and look at it from different perspectives, etc. It also gives flexibility so that um, we're not judging uh, s students by kind of set criteria, exams, where inevitably the uh, newcomer students, students who are learning English, are going to be behind. And every time they get reports back, you know they're being told how inferior they are. Yeah. Uh, if it were based, on, if we we're oriented towards project-based learning, yeah. and they're working in groups and creating um, uh, powerpoints with their inquiry into it, they can showcase their multilingual skills. They can showcase their experience. They may not be able to contribute a huge amount in terms of group discussion if they're still. Um, uh, learning the language, but that group discussion has given them a lot of input in terms of, of uh, learning it. And they can bring their perspectives in, particularly if there's a, a student who speaks their language within the group who's uh, more advanced in English. So I think there's a, a huge um, uh, plus side to the whole notion of deep learning, inquiry-based learning, project-based learning. At the same time, um, students uh, this shouldn't devolve into just a, a kind of total student-centered work where there's no guidance, there's no kind of clear, I think Suzanne used the term uh, succinct and concise information. Students need the information. They need to have uh, certain things demystified for them. For example, how language works. We need to take opportunities to point out uh, how language is working in particular ways. For most kids, when they're learning how to read, some explicit phonics teaching is going to be necessary to get them on the road, and then they need a kind of a rich uh, literature background, a lot of read alouds, a lot of dramatization of the stories, uh, as well as that. So it's a both and. So there's, a, a, there's no contradiction between sort of an explicit, um, you know, teacher led uh, 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 orientation to teaching that is very much compatible and complemented by uh, student-directed learning. Um, the colleagues of mine in, in Toronto, and I coined the term identity texts to talk about 
uh, the kind of dual language uh, book, it doesn't have to be a dual language book, but any kind of creative work that students do in the classroom that is then shared with um, a, a, bro a broader audience. And uh, uh, so that students uh, invest their identities in creating these like artifacts. It could be anything. It could be a story they write. It could be a dual language uh, story they write. It could be a, a project, a science project. It could be a video they put together. Um, uh, it could be music uh, CD they, they put together. Anything, any artifact that they uh, create, uh, either individually or collectively, where they invest their identities into creating that. Um, and once that's out there, once it's, it's out there as, as a book or as, a, as a, something on a web page, um, uh, or, and shared with multiple audiences, their parents, their teachers, their peers, distant classes, um, then it holds a mirror up to students in which their, their identities are reflected back in a positive light. And what that does, as all of us know, is it generates uh, increased engagement. It fuels increased engagement. And so there's got to be uh, uh, space in the curriculum for students to do powerful things with language. Uh, and that should be happening. That should be our orientation from the day the student walks into the classroom. Uh, whether or not they speak uh, no English or minimal English, they're still as intellectually capable as any other, uh, other student. But it's, it's pretty hard in, in classrooms that have not had the, or in schools that have not had the professional development that all of us would, would want uh, to change that mindset. Because some things, some of the common sense ideas that we've got uh, and some of our prejudices about language uh, is, uh, are, are operating there. And so what do I do with this child who doesn't speak English is uh, kind of a plea for help. Uh, but um, there's you know, lots of anecdotal reports from students about what happens to them. Like as Tomer said, we can't just sit in our hands doing nothing, but unfortunately a lot of kids have sat in their hands doing nothing. But that notion of doing powerful things with language, um, that's not a problem uh, if we open the, the classroom space, the instructional space to other languages rather than just confining it to English. If we confine it to English, we're certainly creating deficits amongst uh, students who don't know any English. Some students are very resilient. They learn the language, they'll get over it, if, particularly if they have support from home, if their first language is well developed. But a lot of other kids need much more support. And if we can open up the space so that they can express their intelligence, their creativity through their first language, which they have command of at this point, uh, they're going to do much better. And they'll transfer that confidence and competence to English over time. So, you know, there's, it's not, from one point of view, it's not that complex. I think what all of us have said, what Tina said, what Suzanne said, what, uh, you know, what we've all talked about is um, our strategies that basically say, let's give students every chance to succeed. That means meeting them effectively, uh, welcoming them, creating a, um, a culture of support within the classroom where um, if a newcomer child comes in or a student comes in in the middle of the year, well, what do we do? What would, if we were in that situation in our classroom, when we talk to our, uh, our class, what would we want to happen to us if we were in that situation? Where we're coming in, no friends, don't speak the language, have been coming from kind of difficult uh, certain situations. What would we want to happen? Yeah. And so you, you bring the other students in there as problem solvers. Um, and that, um, you know, helping, I think, again, Suzanne mentioned, you know, we take the load off ourselves if we are not the only person who's making decisions here. And if we open it up and have discussion uh, amongst our, our students about what can we do as a school community, as a classroom community. And uh, a lot of good things can happen there. And the students who are in the classroom right now speak English or are on their way to speaking English relatively well are going to learn a lot from this newcomer student who's coming in if we create that, that uh, environment. Any other comments, questions, issues? <coughs> I was just, uh, any other questions from the audience? Well, okay, Tina. I just want to say, I think that we, we got to look at what teachers are doing right, too. And when we yeah. go in as coaches or whatever, when we're helping, you know, there's a lot of teachers that are doing some awesome things yes. in their classroom. Absolutely. Too. And I think we, you know, as a, as a community in, within school boards um, or provinces, showcase some of what's, what's really good. That, yeah. 
Again, let me just mention something that I think I mentioned briefly early on. Uh, there's um, uh, a, a movement, a relatively recent movement, that has come up with a brilliant name for uh, what we're doing, of what they're trying to do, the language-friendly school. And so who wants to be in a school that's not language-friendly or language-unfriendly? And this is, um, it's uh, kind of, schools can join on a voluntary basis. The kind of entry criteria are minimal, except basically that you try to bring the languages, welcome students' languages into the school. There's some great examples there of schools who have uh, shared their experience. And so it's, um, it's non-threatening, uh, and I think it, it can help change our perspective in terms of what's possible. So that rather than seeing the multilingual reality of our classroom as something that is threatening, difficult, uh, stressful, uh, we see it as an opportunity. And it's really once we kind of move, change the perspective, turn that coin around, look at the, the reality from a different perspective, um, it's not that difficult to, to begin to move in that direction. So languagefriendlyschool.org, yeah. it's, it's worth checking out. Definitely. Um, okay. <laughs> Again. So I just have one last comment here. I really appreciate, Jim, you mentioned that he re reiterated the importance of first language and first culture in assisting learning additional languages and cultures, right? So sometimes additional language learners are, I, I, I would say many, you know, too often are judged by their competence in the language they are learning, right? People see them stumble and, you know, get stuck and they don't understand the language. So their competence and their intelligence is kind of automatically downgraded, right, by, people, by others saying, oh, this person probably now is so smart, right? Yeah, but it's not true, right? As teachers, we know it's not true, but then in a lot of uh, social situations and the people having trouble with the language they're learning are judged by the competence mm -hmm. in that language, right? So. Yeah, and it doesn't happen just to uh, non-native speakers. Mm -hmm. Let me just end with a little anecdote uh, that uh, I experienced um, quite a few years ago. I was giving a talk, uh, I think this was late 80s, uh, I was giving a talk in an international school in Vienna. It was one of the early conferences of the International Schools Association. And um, the organizer of the conference uh, told me this after I'd finished speaking, but he was sitting beside a woman who turned around to him after I'd started speaking and said, where's he from? Because she couldn't place my accent. And the, the organizer said, oh, he's Irish. And this woman said, oh, I thought he had a speech defect, which, <laughs> which shows how easy it is. And um, certainly this, the speakers of Glaswegian English or Belfast English or Dublin English or Newfoundland English are just as competent as the speakers of the Queen's English. Uh, they just may not <laughs> communicate with the right people. <laughs> When I, before I came here, right, at my job interview, the committee actually asked me, right, Newfoundland English is different from the Canadian English, right? And how do you feel about it? Oh, well. I said, wow, as a linguist, you know, I'd love to have an opportunity to hear a different dialect, right? It's so interesting. And so I remember when I first came here, I captured all the differences in pronunciation. I thought, wow, this is fascinating. It's so interesting, right? Yeah.